I've asked Rachel because I struggle to read a bit at the moment. She's going to come and read the Bible passage we're going to look at. Thank you, Rachel. Our passage is Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30. That's Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Jews, or to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for <coughs> Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Holy Spirit, or through the Spirit, predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. <coughs> this happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Wherever you travel in the world, there's one product you can be sure that you can buy. It doesn't matter which continent you visit. It doesn't matter which culture you're in, whether you're in a mega city in South America or whether you're in the desert. There you will find it and there you can buy it. What is it? Coca-Cola. I was in Zambia and I was told that the first words that the children learn in Coca-Cola in English is, in, the first words they learn in English is Coca-Cola. And I remember driving down from Jerusalem, down through the desert, into the south of the Negev. There you can buy Coca-Cola. So how do you explain this uh, phenomenon? It's the result of a deliberate sales strategy. The original entrepreneurs set out as their mission statement that everybody should taste and drink Coca-Cola. And uh, they were pretty successful, don't you think? But the contrast in the New Testament is something quite different because you discover that the news of Jesus spread throughout the Roman Empire spontaneously and naturally. There was no impressive headquarters where plans were made, there were no sales conferences, and there were no sort of big publicity campaigns. All the early Christians had was the agenda of Jesus, first in Jerusalem, and then out into Judea and the wider world beyond. But there were two things that fanned the flames of the gospel in the book of Acts. The first is the Holy Spirit who filled and fired them and totally inspired them. So that Luke records they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word boldly. And the second thing, of course, was the persecution that scattered them. And so Luke records in verse 19, those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch. So while there's no apparent strategy that we can observe, in the providence of God, it was the gift of the Holy Spirit and the persecution that scattered them that caused the work to spread right across that part of Asia Minor. And so... The gospel is beginning to spread in two ways. It goes north from Jerusalem as far as Phoenicia, which is modern Lebanon, the island of Cyprus and the city of Antioch in Syria. But then, interestingly enough, the gospel begins to spread culturally to the Gentiles. 
So in verse 19, Luke states, they were telling the message not only to Jews, some of them, however, began to speak to Greeks, also telling them about the good news of Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So these were really exciting days in the early history of the church. But I want to focus on this one place called Antioch, because the way in which the church was planted there really excites and motivates me. But it was a challenging place for those early Christians to go to. It was an international city like many of our cities today. There was a quarter for Greeks, Romans, Pers uh, Persians, Jews, <coughs> Indians, and even the Chinese. So they were planting a new church in an international city. But it was also an immoral city. According to historians, Antioch was one of the most immoral cities in the ancient world. There were nightclubs, gambling casinos, drinking bars and brothels. And of course, the worship of Diana was the key worship there. And uh, at the temple, they had so many prostitutes available for the sailors that were going through. But here, this exciting new church was planted. So how did it begin? Interestingly enough, it began with what I called spontaneous personal evangelism. This church did not begin with any of the heavyweight apostles like Peter, James and John being sent down from Jerusalem. It did not begin with a well-known evangelist like Philip who had done a tremendous work in, in Samaria, but just some unnamed individuals. We don't even know who these people are who came and they were just telling the message of Jesus to Jewish people and to Greek people. So let's spell a few things out about these unnamed people. First of all, as I've already mentioned, they were anonymous. A huge step forward is being taken in the history of the church. We don't even know who these people are. They go down as the nameless pioneers of Jesus Christ. And yet when they come to this particular city, here they are gossiping the gospel. Secondly, they were courageous. The people who were witnessing in Antioch, but they'd been running for their lives because the persecution that broke out after the death of Stephen was fierce. And so they were fleeing. And you would have thought when they arrived in what they might have thought was a safe place like Antioch, they would have kept their heads down and that they would have stopped witnessing and had some breathing space before they maybe took up the challenge again. But no, they were here witnessing in spite of the fact that they were still running for their lives. And we have to ask, where is this kind of courage and confidence today? I think we have to admit that generally speaking, many Christians in this country are on the back foot and feel almost defeated and deflated because of the challenges that we're facing. You know, I constantly ask myself the question, why is it in countries where it costs so much to be a Christian, as Terry was hinting in Colombia, and I read the reports from their different organization, organizations each day, and sometimes I sit in my study and, and weep because of the brutality <coughs> that many Christians have to face, and yet they do not back down. They just keep going forward. And so why is it in countries where it costs so much to be a Christian that they're prepared to face the cost, but here in our own country where it costs comparatively little, so few are prepared to face any kind of cost. And some of our church members are not even sharing their faith in the workplace for fear perhaps it may tarnish their image or even spoil their <coughs> prospects of promotion. And I took the funeral of a well-known man and somebody came up to me after the service and said, I've worked for him for 20 years. I didn't know he went to church and was a Christian. And we've got people in our congregations like that. These people were courageous. Also, we can say they were spontaneous because they hadn't been commissioned by the apostles in Jerusalem to go and establish a church in Antioch. They hadn't been trained in a Bible college or had special lectures on evangelistic messages. They hadn't also had cross-cultural studies to help them to speak to this international group of people. They just did it spontaneously, naturally, courageously, meeting people in the marketplace, 
the women at the well, travellers in the bazaars, sailors in the pubs, people on the streets. All they did, they talked about Jesus. And they saw a great many people come to faith. And so we can say they were vigorous. Perhaps not the best word to use, but I'm implying by that, that they were really effective. Because the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people turned to the Lord. And so what happened in Antioch, I think reminds me of Graham Kendrick's old song. One shall tell another and he shall tell his friend. Husbands, wives and children shall come following on. From house to house in families, more will be gathered in and lights shall shine in every street so warm and welcoming. And I put in my notes, church planting initiatives need a good nucleus of people who can share naturally and enthusiastically their faith in Jesus. Some church have been planted and they haven't gone anywhere because they have their meetings and activities. There's not real connection with the community and people are not talking about Jesus. Michael Green defined Christian witness in these words. Talking about Jesus by people who've been with Jesus and who are filled with the spirit of Jesus. It's not complicated, is it? It's really basic and simple. Chuck Colson, he said, the best way to spread the Christian message is like the Asian flu. You get it, and you come near me and you catch it, and you take it and give it to somebody else. It'd be wonderful, wouldn't it, if it was as easy as that? I remember going to the Billy Graham uh, uh, Congress on Evangelism in Amsterdam and I was listening to a man called Richard Halverston and he said something that I've never forgotten and I wrote it down. Evangelism never seemed to be an issue in the New Testament. We don't find the apostles urging, scolding, exhorting, planning and organising evangelistic programmes. In the apostolic church, evangelism was somehow assumed and it happened without any special meetings, special courses, special training, or special programs. Evangelism just happened. It issued naturally from the community of believers as light from the sun. It was automatic. It was spontaneous. It was continuous. It was contagious. Isn't that how it should be? But somehow we've lost that ability to talk naturally and easily about Jesus. And so we need to learn that one of the secrets of church growth is using the spontaneous witness, especially of new Christians. And it's exciting, isn't it, when somebody comes into our church plant from outside and they're converted and they suddenly have a whole network of people out there that the rest of the people in the church don't have. And we need to release them and just say to them, you know, share your faith amongst your friends. And they're doing it. We've got one girl who's been a, um, a pole dancer. I'm sure you all know what I mean by that. And she's been wonderfully converted. And within a year, she's led her fiancé to faith in Jesus. And she's led her mother-in-law to faith in Jesus within a year. And it's wonderful to see that. And uh, you've noticed, haven't you, that the new Christians are so uninhibited in sharing their faith. And we have to ask ourselves, what has happened to us if we haven't got that same freedom? I know it's a bit like the honeymoon period. They're so full of joy and so full of enthusiasm. I mean, there's one young guy who's just come to faith in our new church plant, and his father taught him to drink alcohol at 11, and he started him on cannabis for 13 and he's been on that for 20 years. But he's come to faith in a very deep way. And uh, he's just got a brilliant mind. He's reading all books on apologetics. And he read the book, The Case for Christ. And I spoke to him and I said, what did you make of it? And he said, there's so much evidence for Jesus. Why can't people see it? I said, what else did you find in the book? And he read and he sort of fed back to me <coughs> most of what he'd found in the book. And I thought, this guy is going to be a great gift to the church. And he's only probably a matter of a few months on the road with Jesus. He's being baptised on Easter Sunday, and he's invited 30 of his non-Christian friends to come to his baptism. And that's why I say, if you get a new Christian, you know, really encourage them to go out and tell everybody that they can. 
But we've got to do something, haven't we, about the people in our churches. I was speaking about the need to share your faith in a church in Norwich, and a lady came up to me afterwards and she said, I have to admit I've been, and she's from a well-known Christian family, I've been a Christian for over 40 years and I've never talked one-to-one about my faith in Jesus. And she said, if I came over to see you, would you give me some tips to help get me started? And I said, I certainly will. And she came over and we met in a restaurant and we sat down and I gave her some starting points. Prayed with her and she drove home. On the way, she stopped in a coffee shop and she sat down at a table and there was a very friendly lady opposite began to talk to her. And she talked about Jesus to her friend. Well, when she phoned me up, she was flying. And when I saw her a year later, she said, I'm just doing it all the time. And it's often getting people started. And that's why if we have a church plant, we need a nucleus of people who are free to share their faith. Have you had one of those phone calls where you were invited to go on holiday? I was invited with my wife to go on a free holiday to Tenerife. And I said, why are you phoning me? And they said, well, we've decided instead of spending lots of money on publicity, we're going to send hundreds of people on a free holiday because we believe if they have a great time, they will just talk about it. They said, we feel that personal recommendation will prove to be more effective in the long term. We've got a great task on our hands, but in our church plants, let's focus on releasing people to share their faith. Hermann, the German philosopher, stood in front of a statue of Venus of Milo in Milan. He was in a mood of disillusionment and despair. And he came to this particular statue looking for some inspiration. And after a while, he spoke to Venus and said, I suppose you would help me if you could, but you can't. Your lips are silent because your heart is cold. And when I read that, I thought, how true that is. Because it's out of the fullness of your hearts that we speak. And sometimes our hearts can grow cold, and that's when we don't want to talk about Jesus. And Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. And it's only as we drink deeply of Jesus is there an overflow, a stream of living water flowing out into the wider world. You know, we've all been talking about dear Billy Graham, haven't we, recently? And I had the privilege of working with him and chairing his mission at Ipswich Town Football Ground. And uh, the Billy Graham mission was often criticised for mass evangelism. Did you know how Billy Graham answered that criticism? He said, it's not mass evangelism, it's personal evangelism on a large (laughs) scale. And we had such a big job in our area to get people motivated to start inviting and bringing friends. In the next picture that should come up on the screen, there's a picture of the farm where I was brought up. Is it there? Let's bring it up. Because I'm a son of the soil and my father came down from Scotland. Is it not there? Okay, well, not to worry. My father came down from Scotland, brought his dairy herd on the train all the way from Scotland to the rural area of East Anglia. And um, I always say he was a canny Scot because he increased his workforce by seven at no extra expense because he had seven sons. (laughs) And we all worked on the farm as soon as we could walk. And I was brought up on this farm, and it was very remote, miles from anywhere. We had to bite eight miles to the local grammar school. And as someone growing up, I was so shy and inhibited. And I would hide in the barns in the, on the farm when visitors came. And uh, I just found it difficult to communicate with people. And if anybody asked me a question, I would blush to the roots of my hair. And so I really struggled in the early part of my life. And I became a Christian after a period of rebellion because I was so involved in sport. But the interesting thing is, when I became a Christian, I found I'd discovered a great secret, but I couldn't actually talk about it. Then I got called up to go in the army. I know that dates me, and uh, I have just turned 80 But when I went into the army, the leaders of my church got around me and say, young man, if you don't make a stand now, you'll sink. 
Well, when I got to Bury St. Edmunds in the barracks, there were 30 men. I found a bed in the corner where I hoped nobody would notice me, and I put a little New Testament out beside my bunk bed. And that evening, when all the chaps were making crude jokes and creating a bit of a noise, I sank beside my bed and prayed. Took immense courage, I tell you. And I expected boots to fly and pillows to fly and crude jokes, but they all went quiet and showed respect for that little religious bloke in the corner, saying his prayers. And, you know, I didn't take any stick. I wasn't ridiculed for my Christian faith because I was in the rifle team, the athletics team and the rugby team and that sort of thing, which gave me a little bit of kudos amongst my prayer group. But then I went to Cyprus and I was out there during the EOCA campaign. And uh, there were some scary moments hunting um, terrorists in the Trudos Mountains. And, you know, I had the bottle to face all sorts of courageous physical things, but I didn't have the moral courage to talk about my faith. I have to say, I lived under the platitude, it's my life that counts, but I didn't have the courage to talk about any, my faith to anybody. People knew I was a Christian, but it was one of those things I couldn't talk about. When I came home, uh, I went to Scotland, and I had an uncle there, and he was one of those people who could talk about Jesus so naturally and so easily. And I thought, if only I could do that. But when I left Cyprus, a dear man put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Victor, if you're willing, God will restore the years the locusts have eaten. Well, I was willing. I came back home to the farm and I didn't find the men on the farm very easy to talk to uh, or the men in the market when I went to the markets. But then one day I was carrying a bag of meal on my shoulders on some greasy concrete and I did the splits. So I ended up in Ipswich Hospital with a massive hernia. But when I was there, I put a Bible out beside my bed. And when I could, I sat up and read it. And I thought the man next to me would see that and be interested in it and ask me some questions, but he never did. But he turned out to be a farmer. and We talked about farming from morning till evening. And then I left hospital and I felt such a coward again because I got close to sharing my faith, but every time I did, I seem to have so many reasons for not doing it. And I left hospital feeling defeated. And 10 days later, I was back in Ipswich buying a lorry load of cattle for the farm. And I went to a restaurant and I saw the wife of this man. And I said, how is your husband doing? And she burst into tears and said, he took a turn for the worst after you left. And this is the first time I'm out because he died. Can you imagine how I felt? All I could say was, I'm sorry. I went out to my farm vehicle and I completely broke. And I said, Lord, what is wrong with me? I can talk about cricket and football, the weather and 101 other things, but I can't talk about Jesus. What's wrong with me? And God showed me very clearly I was more concerned about my reputation, my image, what people thought of me, than I was about the other person and their need. And I just cried out to God and said, set me free from this kind of prison in which I feel trapped and help me to talk about Jesus. About 10 days later, I was coming back from South End where my fiance was about midnight and I saw a chap hitchhiking and it was in the dark and it was as if God said, pick him up. You won't see how embarrassed, he won't see how embarrassed you are. And after a while, I wished I hadn't picked him up because he smelt absolutely terrible. And I thought, I've got a real roadie on my hands here. But he spoke with a cultured accent. And he started to tell me his story, how his wife had been killed in a car crash and he couldn't bear to go home and look at her home, her possessions and her clothes and things like that. And he just was lost and he'd been sleeping under the hedge. And, you know, I had the courage to say something to him. I just simply said... You know, God can help to heal the hurt in your life. And he turned to me and he said, how would he do it? And I began to share the gospel of Jesus. And with increasing joy and growing confidence, I talked to him one-to-one about Jesus. When we got on the outskirts of Ipswich, he said, I'd like to follow Jesus. And we pulled into a lay-by. I prayed, he prayed, he committed his life to Jesus. And I felt I'd broken the sound barrier. Mm -hmm. I'd opened my mouth and talked to some other person about Jesus and I flew home on air. 
I had the courage to pick somebody up in daylight. I picked up university students. They asked me questions I couldn't answer. That drove me to the Bible. I had to have answers. And my whole prayer life and my whole Christian life took off at that point. I tell you that story because the average person thinks that I just do it easily and naturally, which I do now. And there's nothing I love more than sitting down with one other person. And every day when I wake up, I simply pray, God, create opportunities. And if you do pray that prayer, they'll come. But can you see where my heart is coming from? We can plant a church, but we haven't got people in that church who will talk easily and freely about Jesus. We're not going to progress too much. And I've had ministers in my own area come to me and say, you know, I can stand in the <laughs> pulpit and preach, but I'm no good at talking to others one-to-one -one about Jesus. So I've rather labored that point and I'll deal with, the, deal with the other points more briefly that come out of this particular passage. So church plants need people who can speak naturally and freely about Jesus. Secondly, church plants need what I've called open-hearted church leaders. You see, details of what was happening here in Antioch reached the church leaders in Jerusalem. And they must have had a discussion. How are we going to deal with this? Should we let it run? Should we stop it? Is this movement generally? Are the people really converted? What should they do? We're not told about their initial reactions, but they sent somebody to investigate, which is always a wise thing to do if you ever hear of a new movement arising. You know, people pick up things secondhand, don't they? And they start criticizing a new movement. Go and see for yourself before you dare to criticize. So who did they send? They sent Barnabas. As William Barclay says in his commentary, they sent the man with the biggest heart in the church. He was a generous man with a warm heart and an open spirit. It would have been disastrous if they'd sent down to Antioch somebody who was rather rigid and narrow-minded in their thinking, somebody who was still trapped in Jewish rules and regulations, somebody who was still wanting to uphold synagogue traditions, rather than really helping this spark of Christian faith that's just beginning. And you know, things that must have been really different in this new church plant. Jews and Gentiles could have been eating at the same table. And Gentiles were probably being welcomed into this new fellowship without being circumcised. And maybe kosher food regulations were being overlooked. And informal services were being held without synagogue lit liturgy. Maybe even husbands and wives were sitting together. So in this cosmopolitan city, this new church plant would have a radical and an experimental feel about it. If the wrong leader had gone from Antioch, who was a bit narrow and rigid in his thinking, he would have been like a wet blanket and he would have smothered this new spark, this new flame that was emerging. But in the grace of God, they sent Barnabas. Look at what they say about Barnabas, what Luke records. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. A good man, generous and open-hearted, full of the Holy Spirit, not cluttered up with religious prejudice, full of faith. He believed with God all things are possible, even if they were radically different. He was an ideal character to go down and develop this new church plant. And we're told how he responded. Look at what he saw. He saw the evidence of the grace of God. He saw lives that had been radically transformed, even if they were stepping on people's traditional toes. He could see, too, how they had been transformed. We're told how he reacted. He was glad that here in a pagan, sensuous, idolatrous city, the mercy of God had reached these people and brought them salvation. He was thrilled with what he saw. And we're told what he did. He encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. What a beautiful scripture. How these people at times would need somebody to put their arms around them and just to encourage them and to believe in them and to reassure them that what had happened to them was genuine and was from God. He encouraged them with all his heart to remain true to the Lord. And so if church plants are going to grow, they're going to need a nucleus of people who can talk about Jesus in the streets, 
in their places of work, which is a huge mission field. We've appointed a chaplain in a workplace in Bury St Edmunds to try and encourage Christians at work to share their faith. And we need good, open-hearted church leaders. I came across this quote. It's powerful. Many church leaders are more like Caiaphas the high priest than Barnabas the son of encouragement. They are men of rigid and inflexible minds, restricted by their rules and regulations. Instead of fostering initiative among their members, they feel threatened by them. Rather than enjoying new developments in worship, they are critical of them. Instead of encouraging new converts, they turn them away by their serious and insensitive approach. Do you know my early days of uh, tent evangelism with counties, <coughs> which I absolutely loved because those were the days when you'd have four or five hundred children a night and two or three hundred teenagers a night. People just used to flock and come. And then there was always the problem what to do with the new Christians. And I remember in one church we introduced some new Christians. But they all got turned away because they weren't warmly welcomed and uh, they were told certain things were inappropriate. You know, the women had to wear hats. And I had a delegation from a group of elders that came to me in one town because I was giving young people scripture union notes. And this is what they said. How can you expect these clerics to lead these young people into brethren principles? And they wanted me to stop giving them. Do you know, in my early days, it was really hard. And I got to a point where I thought, we'll go out and just start a fellowship for the people. Because I could see that there were people who were <coughs> rigid in their thinking. And sometimes people can come and join church plants. And they come in with their own ideas and their own traditions. And they want to change things. And it is so unhelpful. And it just dampens the spirit. Things must have been so different in this new church in Antioch. And I'm now working in this new church plant, and it is so different. We had a couple of drunks walked in uh, last week, and they loved the singing, and one of them jumped up and said, that was great, do it again. You know? <laughs> but nobody worried, because the atmosphere and the ethos of the church is such that if things like that happen, it doesn't matter. We just love everybody. And everybody who walks in, we've trained our people you know, not to look at them furtively or kind of judge them by how they're dressed. But I say, look at everybody as somebody made in the image of God who can be transformed by the love of Christ, who can be filled with his spirit and transformed and become useful in his service. And that's the only way to look at them. And so, so thirdly, how are we doing? Do I stop at two, don't I? Stop at two. Is that right? Uh, no, you've got... Um Another minute or two. Yeah, well, you tell me. You, 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 you got an hour, brother. You, you tell me when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> number three. Number three. New church plants need well informed Christian teachers. Verses 25 to 26. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the Christians were first called Christians at Antioch. I think Barnabas must have been a man of humility. He was willing to share this exciting ministry rather than try and do it all himself. And you know, sometimes somebody who helps to plant a church begins to look upon it as their church and begins to sort of want to hold on to the limelight. And that again is disastrous. He's willing to share this exciting ministry with somebody else. He needed, he knew, needed help, and he was willing to look for it. And he was also a man of strategy. He was a Jew who would have little understanding of Gentiles, but he knew a man who had been brought up in Jewish tradition and somebody who understood Gentile culture and customs. He knew just the man to go for, and so he headhunted Saul of Tarsus. And of course, Saul was a religious Jew, a brilliant scholar, brought up at the Hebrew University at the feet of Gramaliel, just the man to work alongside Jewish people. But he was also a Roman citizen, so he would be eloquent in Greek, familiar with Greek culture and literature. 
and Barnabas knew of his God-given gift to the Gentiles. And so he went to look for him and they formed a wonderful team. And so they were teaching the people for a whole year. And one of the things we found in this new church plan is the need to have good quality Bible teaching every Sunday. So unashamedly, we'll have a half an hour talk, even though 80% of the people in this new church plan are new Christians. We've grown not through people migrating from other churches, but through people becoming Christians. We do use the PowerPoint a lot. It's the old Chinese proverb says, one in the eye is worth two in the ear. <laughs> and people need to see and visualize things. So, and we do a lot of creative things in our teaching. It's not just a kind of monologue as I'm doing now, we'll, we'll ask them questions and we'll make them sit down and talk about things. And a lot of it is interactive, but we do good quality teaching and we make it go right through the year. We plan our whole syllabus for the year. And that is so important. They're never gonna have a foundation, are they, to their faith unless it's really based on the word of God. And so we want them to be rooted in the word of God and we've got some of them memorizing scriptures and they're loving it. We've got others who can't read very much, but they're learning fast as well and listening to messages on tape. Number four, they even had in this new church plant, can you believe it, some spiritually inspired prophets. We're told here that several prophets came down to Antioch, but only one is mentioned and his name is Agabus. He stood up and predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. Prophets, of course, we'll skip over this quite quickly, have two functions, foretelling the future, as Agabus did. There's a famine coming, and we know it happened historically. But then there's the other gift of prophecy, foretelling, speaking God's word in certain situations saying, this is what I sense God is saying. And we're even finding this gift is emerging among some of the even young Christians in the church. They're so in touch with God that, that they, they will come and say, I feel this is what God wants us to do. And we need to listen to them. And maybe some of us have uh, tended to squash prophecy a bit. But we need to remember those words in 1 Thessalonians 5. Do not treat prophecies with contempt but test everything, hold on to the good. There's a lot of ridiculous things said under the title of prophecy, and I've heard them. But there are times when God does speak through people into the congregation, and we need to hold on to what is good. And we need to be prepared for that to happen in our new church plants, because that's often when progress is actually made. And finally, New church plants need some compassionate and generous Christians. I get that from verses 29 and 30. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. What a lovely thing is happening here. A young church decides to help an established church. And a Gentile church is going to be helping a Jewish church. Isn't that remarkable? It must be a huge tribute to the teaching of Barnabas and Saul, so that a Greek congregation, 300 miles from Jerusalem, should be so concerned about their fellow Christians that they make a voluntary collection even before the famine has begun. And so these young Christians are not only good at witnessing, but they're also good in caring and in giving. So here you have in this young church an extraordinary expression of Christian fellowship and a true understanding of what the body of Christ is all about. Though they are the church in Antioch, they're also concerned about their brothers and sisters worldwide. And it's good to help our new Christians in our new church plants to understand there's a big world out there and to have offerings for things that are happening in other places. And you know, I'm finding that those new Christians are sometimes more generous than established Christians. I'm amazed. There's one guy who I was helping, and um, he was a real alcoholic, but he's finished with his alcoholism, and he hasn't drunk any for quite some time now. 
and um, he heard of a young couple getting married who hadn't really got much money and he's living on benefits and I was amazed how much of his weekly allowance he gave and was prepared to go without in order to help this young couple get started and I was sitting near a married couple and she said to him we haven't brought in the offering he says well I've got a couple of quid she said you can't give that that's an insult you know we've got to give more than that and I'm really touched by the generosity of young Christians in our own new church plant. And it's something I think that we can encourage. And it's a great joy in giving. And they will find real blessing in giving. I often wonder if Karl Marx knew these words from the scriptures. Because it's very close, isn't it, to the Communist Manifesto. Each according to his ability and help. And each according to a person's need. Well, the communist philosophy may have been based on these phrases, but his dream was fulfilled with bureaucrats, labor camps, and tanks. But the spiritual revelation, revolution happening in this new church plant was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it produced compassion, and it produced generosity. So let's teach our new Christians to be generous, because that will have a spin-on effect in the church. So just to sum up, church planting in Antioch, spontaneous, personal evangelism. I've watched some new churches start and they haven't progressed because they're not talking about Jesus. And Terry said early, it's all about Jesus. And some of us need to find even greater freedom to talk <coughs> about Jesus. Open-hearted and sensitive leaders. Let's not be a damp squib you know, at any time when new things are happening. Let's try and see, as Barnabas did, the grace of God, if it's God at work, even though it may be different than what we don't expect. And let's have good Bible teachers in our new church plants. If we haven't got the gift in there, bring some people in to help us. And don't damp down the gift of prophecy. It's something God still uses. And let's create a culture of compassion for others and generosity as well. And we often say to our people a phrase you will have heard, what kind of a church would my church be if every church member was just like me? And that makes them all look at themselves. So there were a few things I just had on my heart to share today. I didn't want it to be heavy as it was after lunch, but I hope it's been heavy, helpful. <laughs>